Hello, and welcome to today's Hamlin Leo Lecture, short, timely talks that offer innovation and inspiration from Hamlin thought leaders. I'm Molly Glevy from Hamlin's Alumni Relations Office, and I am very pleased that you're joining us today uh, for job searching during COVID-19. I have a few things to go through, and then we'll hand it over to my colleagues from our Career Development Center. Here we go. You will be muted and your camera will be off for today's presentation. If you have a question for our speakers, please use the Q&A icon in your Zoom dashboard on your screen. And if you have questions throughout, just go ahead and put them through as they come to mind. Masha and Mara will answer questions at the end, but you do not need to wait to the end to ask your question. If you have a question about the logistics of today's webinar, please use the chat icon. There are a few of us on board who can help troubleshoot if need be. The recording of this webinar will be at hamlin.edu backslash alumni weekend. So if you have friends or former classmates or colleagues who you think might benefit from this information, or if you need to jump out in the middle, you'll be able to find this online probably later today, maybe tomorrow. Um, Finally, please be patient with us as we are presenting from all sorts of different places. You could see pets or lawnmowers. There's, I think, a bit of construction happening out of my window. So uh, be patient with us as we move through uh, our technology. And I will also mention we are celebrating Hamlin's Homecoming and Alumni Weekend all week long. We decided not to wait for the weekend, but to start early. Uh, there are uh, a few events yet this week. We have Hamlin Trivia happening tomorrow at noon. It's also hosted through Zoom. And we have one final Leo lecture on Friday with Professor David Schultz. That will be at 1130, also through Zoom. And there is a ton of fun content on our Alumni Weekend webpage. And with that, I would love to introduce Masha and Mara. Masha Finn is a career counselor at the Career Development Center here at Hamlin, and in this role, she meets individually with students and recent grads to support their exploration and vocational planning. Masha received her BA in International Relations and French and Francophone Studies from Carleton College and her MA in Educational Psychology, Counseling and Student Personnel Psychology from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. And Mara Stomas is also a career counselor at the Career Development Center. In this role, she also collaborates with students and recent grads to explore majors, careers, future graduate school or employment opportunities, and works to build relationships with employers. Mara received her BS in Family Social Science and her MA in Counseling and Student Personnel Psychology, also from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. And I should mention that both Masha and Mara presented last week for us a Leo lecture on interview skills during COVID-19, which is on our website. And I would highly recommend uh, if you didn't attend that session and you are viewing this one, uh, go back and watch that one as well. It'd be a really nice compliment to what uh, my colleagues will talk about today. And with that, I am going to hand over my screen to Masha and Mara. Take it away. Thank you, Molly. Yeah. Uh, so my name is Mara. I will be um, co-hosting this presentation today with Masha. Um, I am a career counselor at the Career Development Center and also collaborate with employers who are looking to hire Hamlin graduates. Um, I'll let Masha introduce herself and then we will kind of get started here. My apologies. I, for some reason, the clicking is non-responsive right now. Hold on one moment. There we go. Um, yeah, so my name is Masha Finn and uh, I'll be jumping in later on to share some more information. Thanks, Masha. Yeah, we will also be using interactive polling um, in this presentation. It'll just happen once to kind of get a sense of who's in the room and what you're experiencing in the job market. Um, but we'll be kind of focusing on job searching during COVID um, and what that means and how you can kind of propel yourself forward in kind of a chaotic time. Um, 
prior to jumping in there, I want to let you know that um, for those of you who may be following us or kind of watching now um, and are within three years of your graduation date, we do still offer career counseling and it is available to you at an unlimited basis up to three years post-grad. Um, so come and connect with us. Um, for those of you who are maybe a little past that, you do also have, you have access to our online resources where we have a bunch of different materials um, and things that you can use. Masha and I will have our emails at the end of this presentation. So if you're looking for something in particular and can't find it on our website, we'll be sure to help kind of get you directed to where you need to be of the resources you're searching for. Um, you all have kind of lifetime access to Handshake, which is our newish job and internship posting board. We got it back in November, um, but it's a really great way to connect with employers, search for positions, current opportunities, um, and highly recommend using that and setting up that profile. Um, we'll also talk about some other resources to kind of search for jobs and internship or positions, full-time opportunities, excuse me. Um, yeah, we can progress to the next slide. So to get kind of a sense of those of you watching, if you can um, open up a new web tab on your computer or even text Leo 2020 um, and then type in 22333 to join, um, to text, text that number, you'll join this answer and you can just kind of free response. What have you noticed in your job search? Or for those of you who may not currently be job searching or looking to job search, what are you hearing? What are you anticipating? And you can just feel free to free response um, this in a text or on your computer. So we'll give it a minute here. There are no jobs available in the field I want to enter. Yeah. And feel free to ask in the Q&A or share kind of what field you're looking into if you want to have further discussion on that at the end of this presentation. Be interested to see what field you're interested in. And then they'll continue to pop up. Um, risk. Yeah, I almost want to ask a little bit more like what risk might mean. Um, is it risky to look? Uh, many unknowns companies have hiring on hold definitely interview process is extremely slow we will touch on timelines at this time definitely changed a lot um, a lot of organizations are experiencing a lot of fluidity so you may be getting mixed signals of like we're hiring no we're not um, we're pulling back better to leave networking is difficult we're going to definitely touch on networking um, not many employers respond yeah, there's a lot of things. Better to leave an okay situation for one that is uncertain. Yeah, please feel free to follow up later and share more context and we can um, support you in that process or do our best to give you some points of feedback. Um, staying positive, it's probably hard to do that right now. Definitely, yeah. We're holding out a lot, a lot of ambiguity at this time. There isn't a playbook. No, there's really not a playbook. Um, I will say we'll touch on some things in the playbook that exist that still are really useful um, and we'll get into those. But yeah, maybe we can progress to the next slide here. Um, so yeah, the current context, very fluid, ambiguous. We know that a national unemployment rate is at 8.4%. Most recent data shows that. And the Minnesota unemployment rate is at 7.4%. This um, is down from the peak of around, I think it was 9 or 10% in May. Um, so it is slowly going down. I think it went about a percentage point down last um, since last month. Um, however, it's obviously much higher than it was at this year last year at this time last year and we are seeing actually racial and ethnic disproportionate disparities among groups so um yeah it's just it's been a really hard time i think a lot of things are being elevated um and we want to emphasize and kind of affirm the difficulties that are happening right now i'd say mosh and i also hope to give you some kind of concrete things that you can do to kind of push forward and perhaps increase a little bit of 
stamina in this time. Um, and please continue to connect with us and we'll also provide you with some resources for you to get it connected with others. Um, so. so a huge part, I'm gonna actually transition back to Masha here cause she'll be kind of starting out the importance of marketing yourself at this time. Yeah, so um, with all of this ambiguity and some of those <clears throat> really challenging numbers to see the statistics, um, I think a big part of this is figuring out, um, looking at all that context, how can you uh, be your best self in all of your materials? How you, can you present yourself in the ways that are most authentic to you and showcase your strengths the most, because I think oftentimes in these difficult times, that can be a hard thing to recognize is that you do have strengths that you bring to the table. And um, part of this is making sure that other people know it as well. So I'm gonna talk a bit about transferable skills. And so this is a term that's often used in our office because no matter what kinds of positions you've held in the past, you are um, experiencing um, and gaining knowledge and skills that are going to be useful to you in the future. And that's essentially what transferable skills are. So they're these top level skills, problem solving, something that you can, uh, that you can bring from a previous role into your next role, a strong work ethic, uh, the ability to be analytical and quantitative um, with, with data or um, with the approach that you're taking in your, in your job. Um, and so I think oftentimes people, when they're looking to transition or they're trying to find opportunities that might not be exactly in line with what they did, I'm thinking about um, uh, whoever submitted uh, that there are no jobs available in their field right now. Some of the transferable skills can help you think beyond what might be uh, available um, within your field and think what are some, um, some areas you could transition into that are field adjacent or that are able to um, use your skills in really great ways, but maybe in a different context. And so I think recognizing these skills, these areas, these are the top skills sought by employers, can help you take more control and kind of empower yourself to see that you can find opportunities, uh, maybe outside of what you're uh, directly familiar with and allow you to transition more effectively. And so part of this is taking inventory. So as you look at your past experiences, what are those skills that really show up for you? Is it a lot of communication that you've done in your past positions? Is it that analysis that you've done in several different roles, but maybe in different contexts? How do those align to what you're trying to transition into? How can that help you make that move? And so part of the inventory is taking stock of what you have and then making sure that your materials are showing that. So in your application materials, are those transferable skills easy to spot? Is it clear the ways that those are gonna align to the positions that you're applying for? Because if it's unclear to the employer, they're not necessarily gonna do that extra work trying to map it out for themselves. You kind of have to do the work for them on the front end so that they see exactly the ways that you're gonna be a good fit. Um, another way to notice where your transferable skills are showing up for you is in your LinkedIn account, and we'll talk about LinkedIn uh, a little bit later as well, but your, any of the presence that you have online or uh, the presence that you have, how you're known through other people, maybe through your colleagues or your friends, what's your brand? What are you known for? That can help you come up with that list and make sure that it's showing up, um, not just you know, in your brain, but in your materials. And then transferable skills can be really useful to you in your interview. So as you think about um, what are your goals in getting across the things that are most essential to you, the ways you can contribute, your qualities, maybe those are things that are going to really shine through during that interview. Um, and so that can also help you take stock of, okay, what am I known for? How do I want to be known? And then also um, take inventory by looking back at feedback or thinking about some of the information maybe you've received from past supervisors or colleagues. Uh, what have you been told about where you uh, where your strengths really lie? And um, that can be a useful way to kind of take stock um, and connect the dots. So 
again, the employers aren't gonna do the extra work to look through your resume and figure out the ways that you're gonna fit into that position. You kind of have to do it for them. And so those transferable skills are a really great way to focus the attention of the employer um, as you transition. So your resume is one of the great places where that stuff can really shine. And so I wanna, um, we're not gonna spend a ton of time on the resume, but I really want to focus on some main points. And this is a fake resume um, that's been split up into two bits just so that you can see it better. Ultimately, it's just a one pager. Um, but what you can see from this is even structurally, it's easy to skim. It's easy to find the information, the positions, the bullet points really focus the attention of the, of the reader. Um, they have a LinkedIn um, profile linked at the top. So if they want to learn more about you, they can. And um, I'll just focus on a few different elements of a resume that can help you market your skills really effectively. One of those is numbers. So quantifying your responsibilities and showing your impact through actual numbers in your resume. Um, it can be a really effective way um, to, show, to show your successes. Having really strong and action-oriented skill statements are another way to do that. You can see how, um, how specific this is. Hired, trained, and supervised 10 interns over three years. So you exactly know what that position entailed, what the outcome was, was you know doing performance evaluations, pro professional development, all of that. And you'll notice that in all of these examples uh, throughout this resume, there's there are really strong um, and specific statements that are focused on what's the outcome, what results were you able to get, what's the nature of the work that you did. Um, because again, the employers aren't going to try to come up with that themselves. So you really have to hone in on those skills and showcase them. And then the last thing I'll show is those focused and tailored headings. So having relevant experience instead of just work experience. So right away, they're gonna look at that section and uh, pay attention to that maybe above the others, which is probably what you want anyway. And having a profile that's specific to what you want to do and focus on who you are um, can also really help because usually employers spend, um, spend their time looking at the top half of the page and so that can help focus their attention. So brief overview of resumes, we have more information on our website, but um, this might be a helpful way to think about how you want to organize your information so they really pay attention. And I'll switch over to Laura, talk about applicant tracking systems. Thanks, Masha. Yeah, so as Masha kind of highlighted some of those elements of the resume, I think another kind of barrier, an unknown barrier sometimes, is the applicant tracking system that that employer may be using. These are more common at large companies and organizations. Um, I can say from employer perspective, for instance, you know, some applicant tracking systems are going to be able to read and they're going to look for those certain keywords. So as Masha was sharing about those strong skill statements and transferable skills, particularly if you're seeing in the job description, um, you know, strong orientation to detail or strong detail oriented, um, detail oriented. Um, then you might want to include those same verbiage and language in your actual resume if it applies and is accurate to you because these applicant tracking systems are going to look for keywords um, to see if you match up with that job description. Um, so there's about 75% of um, applicants that are kind of taken out in an applicant tracking system because of just errors in the system, which, you know, leads us probably down a different conversation around the usability and usefulness of them. But like, like we all saw, like, like there's a lot of people applying. So this is good, kind of a quick expedited way to kind of finalize your applicants and doing a little bit of that work with artificial intelligence. So some way to get past the applicant tracking system outside of highlighting those transferable skills and kind of using, you know, we're never recommended to copyright, right? But this might be the area in which copywriting is kind of your best friend, as long as you know you're not copying and pasting that job description into your past job descriptions. Um, ways that you're matching up or aligning is gonna be really useful. So um, you can actually on the 
the last tip here, using jobscan.co to compare your materials versus the position description. It actually allows you to kind of copy and paste your resume and perhaps your cover letter. And then also the position description will show you where you align. Um, and then you can kind of see like, you know, sometimes it feels like it fits. And then you look at it and you see the comparison. You're like, oh, maybe I could use a couple more of these words here. And they, you know, they're just synonyms. Um, so yeah, use those keywords. Um, remove graphics or tables that you may have on your resume. Sometimes it kind of stunts the system and then you can't uh, push forward. So again, with the graphics and tables, it's also at times limiting the creativity. So the resume example that you all saw before is pretty, you know, pretty clear and um, uh, doesn't really use any form of template or doesn't have much color on it. And that really is the, we have some templates similar to what we just showed you actually on online on our website that you could use um, that will help support these applicant tracking systems to be able to read it more clearly. Um, and then if they ask, you know, upload in PDF or Microsoft Word, and sometimes you might get kind of mixed signals, but in that final step, wherever it gives that direction, really recommend using the format that they ask for because it may impact whether your resume gets seen or not or your application. So wanted to touch on those applicant tracking systems. I also will say from um, employers that I've heard that work in government, they are very particular about the amount of information. So you may also get into an application and notice there's a spot to upload your resume, but there's also a spot to kind of copy and paste your resume. I do recommend doing both. I know it takes up a lot of time, but some of those systems, especially in kind of those government roles, they will kind of, they ask for maybe hours and amount of time that you spent in that role. And that's to help them um, understand kind of your level of knowledge and experience, because that will impact how much you get paid. Um, and I've heard specifically from those organizations that they actually, if you don't indicate those hours that are specified, they will actually give you kind of the least amount of hours possible. So, you know, maybe you worked a month in a role or, you know, six months, but it was, you know, full time. They may assume that you were part time. They, they may just assume kind of the less, the lesser half. So you really want to make sure you're giving the credit where it's due and recommunicating, you know, by uploading and then recommunicating again by copying and pasting into their system because that may impact this applicant tracking system. Um, so I want to touch on that with employers. So outside of thinking around kind of those transferable skills, giving yourself that time and space to really sit down with your experiences, kind of find what sticks out to you? What is your brand? How would you like to communicate kind of who you are and where you want to move forward and why? A big part of this will also be through outreach and networking. You know, um, we'll touch on this, but one of you touched on networking is really hard. So we're going to touch on that. So yeah, 70 to 80% of positions are actually obtained through networking. Um, it's kind of like when we look through, we're going to share some ways that you can search online for positions and, and kind of job sites that we recommend and databases. However, this is kind of like the hidden job market and I'm sure you are, are all well aware um, that a lot of positions are, are received through networking. I would say that's even more given the times in COVID um, because there's a lot less, a lot more applicants and a lot fewer positions. Um, so kind of in tandem while you're working on kind of what you're trying to communicate, who you are and how you want to push through in applications, also trying to network with people you can and, you know, it may take a lot of messaging to a lot of different people before you can get some traction, but really trying to persevere, highly recommend. So some ways that you can kind of help feel a little less overwhelmed as you look to network is we do have a spreadsheet and you'll get copies of these slides that we have here and they're all embedded links. Um, but make a spreadsheet of your people, kind of brainstorm, you know, who's in your family, who are past colleagues, who was in their family maybe, what did they do? Um, and really trying to start with thinking about people that you know or may know of other people. So another way to figure out if, you know, 
you don't know if they know someone you'd be interested in chatting with is trying to draft, encourage you to draft an email template, which you can personalize to each individual that you send. But I would highlight that you would include these four components is going to be really important kind of check in with that warm opening, share who you are. Um, reintroduce yourself, you know, if it's been a while since you've connected with this person or kind of share what you've been doing and then highlight that you're currently in the job market and be specific about the roles or industries that you're looking into. I think this be specific piece about what you're looking into is the part that's missed the most. Um, and even if you're a little unsure, even if you have kind of a best guess of like, I think this is where I'd want to go, feel unsure if that's possible, still write it. Encourage you to write that and identify that. And then ask, um, you know, would they be able to have a conversation to get some insights and perhaps think of anyone that they might know in their network um, that they could recommend or pass along any positions they may see. So the ask is kind of kind of a triple whammy here with these three questions. Um, perhaps it's a conversation to gain more insight if you know that they are in a similar field of one you're looking into. Um, perhaps if, you know, keep my, is there anyone that maybe is in your network that you'd maybe recommend that I connect with to learn more about this field or industry or kind of transition into back into this area and then passing along any recommendations of positions that they may see because maybe, you know, they're in a hiring position or they're seeing a lot of positions in the role that they work in. Um, but yeah, highly recommend reaching out to people, you know, if you know, they really can't help you if they don't know. And I would say, even if you've had the brief conversation, following up in with email and having that kind of written reminder for them is going to be really useful. Another way, so, oh, we'll touch on LinkedIn in a second here, but, um, Essentially, what you're asking for to connect is informational interviewing, and perhaps some of you have already engaged in informational interviewing before, but I just wanted to highlight a few kind of key points here as you perhaps think about this. So this is going to be perhaps a 20 to 30 minute conversation, maybe longer, um, where you're going to kind of get a sense of this person's background, um, their current role, and how maybe their feedback about kind of how their industry has been impacted due to COVID, um, insights that they're kind of hearing across their organization or other similar organizations. I would say a lot of people in um, different industries will kind of have an industry idea of, you know, what's, what's the talk um, and getting you insight into what that is so that you can be a more informed job candidate when you maybe write that cover letter or you apply um, and connect in person or virtually, of course, actually in an interview. So there is some preparation as you look to perhaps inter informational interview someone you know, or as we'll kind of progress in here, someone you may not know. Um, you know, spending some time researching the organization and the position that person is currently in is going to be really important because you're going to want to come with prepared questions. And the last thing you want to do is have any questions that you could have found out online or about their position um, already answered. Um, so even if you see someone with a similar position and you see a, that same description online but hiring in a different organization, you could maybe make some assumptions about that position and then ask specific questions um, and say, you know, I've been seeing like account manager positions um, and this is kind of what they're looking for. What's your take on what that means to that employer, what, what you might recommend on how that could be showcased in an application really trying to get specific about those questions and then prepare what your background is. Um, I know that, you know, depending on the context, it could be difficult to share just all that's been going on lately. Um, but trying to really practice um, and writing down like a 30 minute kind of brief intro to kind of what's going on right now and trying to share that positivity, you know, that may be small, but that you have about kind of meeting and networking with others. And then during, Kind of your conversation as you kind of think about what you want to ask in those specific questions. Um, I was just reading uh, a book that has been recommended and they talked about just sharing observations. So in that conversation you're getting to know them, sharing observations that you're noticing in those job descriptions, observations that you've noticed about their career path in, the, in their background. Maybe you have their LinkedIn profile and you've seen kind of how their career has um, changed over the years, sharing observations about that, and then asking questions in relation to those observations can be really key for kind of feeling a natural flow for that conversation. Um, um, and then asking any advice that they may have for you as you look further. 
the most important or one of the most important questions I'd recommend you all to ask it kind of towards the end of your um, conversation is asking them about any other contacts or people they might have in their network that they could share with you based on that conversation and your interests. You'll be surprised. A lot of people have a lot of different people that they'll want to connect with you or um, know that you may not have anticipated. And most people love, I mean, the great thing about informational interviewing, most people love talking about their background and what they're doing and what they're up to. Um, and they're also going to be really eager to see kind of what they can do for you. And this is a really great chance for them to share what that might be um, and who that may be that you could connect with. Um, and then as you kind of conclude at the end of that conversation is always following up with a written thank you is going to be really important as well. So we touched on LinkedIn a little bit, and I really want to spend some time highlighting um, LinkedIn as a tool to connect with others and just learn about what people are doing. So if you actually type in the search bar on the top left of, your, of LinkedIn, and if you don't have a profile, please get one. It's a great, um, it's kind of like a social media tool, but really in a professional social media tool where you get kind of see everyone's professional background and then explore what they've done and what you could do. There's also great job postings. Um, they have a great platform for posting jobs here as well and have a pretty good search engine. Um, but if you search Hamlin University in that initial bar um, and then you kind of get to our page on education, or it's the education, it, it'll pop up as an education uh, group. Um, you'll see this alumni button here on the bottom left and you can actually search by the organization. So you can search, you know, there's a, a good variety of Hamlin folks who maybe work at Wells Fargo. You know, you can search at all the Wells Fargo folks. Um, and then you can also search by location. So whether, you know, you're local or not, you can see across the US or globally where Pipers are um, and then see who you might connect with that's more local to you if that's where, you're, if you're hoping to stay in that area. And then you can also look at area of interest. So you can search by broad industry categories as well. And then it'll filter and give you all the individuals at which point you can kind of click someone's profile, see what they're currently doing, what they have been doing, what they've done in the past, what education background they have, and then use that to prepare perhaps a reaching out of conversation where you can connect and message them um, and ask, you know, I noticed XYZ in your profile. I'd love to connect with you. Saw your fellow Piper. I'd say a lot of Hamlin um, alums that I've reached out to just for networking events have been really welcoming to um, other supporting other Hamlin grads. So highly recommend using this tool. Um, you may also find if you have a pretty uh, expanded profile, you'd be able to see how many connections you may have between that person, at which point we would recommend, you know, if there's someone in your network who's connected with someone you're trying to get in touch with, asking for that in introduction between, between you and that other person. Another thing you can do as you're building your profile is as you kind of find your profile, I have mine here, you can see add profile section, um, do that tab down arrow and then share that you are looking for job opportunities. So what this does is it doesn't show that what if anyone were to go to your profile that you're looking, but what it does is it does alert recruiters who do use LinkedIn to find talent that you are searching. So by clicking and adding this to your profile, even though it's not, you know, visually seen to anyone who's viewing, it's shown to those and alerted to those recruiters so that they can search for you on the front end or on the back end. Um, and you may get more messages that way too. So um, be noted that, or be, be cautioned that you may get messages um, by clicking this. And then you'll just kind of have to sift through and see, you know, if that's, if that recruiter that reaches out to you is someone of interest. Um, but through this, you can also, we'd recommend identifying the job titles that you're interested in, the location and job types, because then LinkedIn can um, actually suggest personalized suggestions of organizations you could look into or position openings that currently exist. Also wouldn't, um, one kind of silver lining about COVID is a lot of organizations are now moving to, you know, really working remote. So there's 
been an uh, increase in remote positions that you'll find online as well. And you may at this, you know, up until now, you may have been kind of limited in terms of your ability to move or be in a different state um, and your options perhaps to apply to a wide variety of positions across the US may have increased. So be aware for that too. I also want to highlight in the networking kind of this section of getting engaged is the there's some current um, job fairs coming up. So on October 20th, there's an LGBT career fair coming up for LGBT um, friendly organizations or who support the LGBT community. Um, highly recommend um, perhaps looking into that one, as well as the government and nonprofit career fair that will be happening um, late October from 10 to three and there will be a good amount of employers in the government and nonprofit sector available. That will also be happening virtually. Um, you'll also see, I've linked here and I just saw a question that these slides and these links will be um, sent out after this presentation, but Career Force Minnesota, so you will get this information in the links. Career, Career Force Minnesota has a lot of virtual events and kind of networking events as well as professional development events. Um, I think they even offer, you know, one on one conversations for, you know, professionalism or sprucing up your resume, things like that um, and career conversations as well. So be aware that this, these will exist and I encourage engaging in these platforms to kind of even spread um, uh, widen your network even further um, and get connected. So I just want to reiterate um, how valuable that networking can be. Um, so I think oftentimes when people are going about a job search, reaching out to people and networking and kind of establishing those connections with folks tend to be kind of the last thing on their minds. Um, usually you're, you're in such a state of, um, you know, crisis or urgency that you're applying for jobs. That's the priority is sending those applications out. And uh, making those connections and networking really helps to reinforce the applications that you send later. Um, so it helps establish connections and put it gets allows people to put in a good word for you and refer you to possible possible positions. And when competition is great, which it is right now, um, that extra push is really what can get those resumes in the hands of the people you want to see them. So I strongly recommend kind of networking being a great foundation for you as you move forward. And it can help address um, some of these topics as well, timelines and search strategies, which I'll get into and I know are on a lot of your minds. So in terms of job search timelines, in general, it can take between two to six months to find a position. That's very industry dependent. It depends on the need of the particular organization, how quickly they're able to move, how quickly they're able to um, solidify funding for that role, um, how large their HR department is. I mean, there's so much that's dependent on that. Um, but the, the numbers on the right are from an evaluation that was made pre-COVID of majority um, corporate organizations and how long it might take, it, it takes them to go from posting a job to scheduling an interview, and then how long it might take for them to go from scheduling an interview to um, providing a job offer. So I think that shows that even during, even before COVID-19, those timelines can be pretty lengthy. And so I think that's important to know, not to, not to bum you out, um, but to set expectations um, so that um, it, those timelines, you know, they're going to be extended due to COVID, but also it often takes um, organizations a while to reach out to you, to confirm interviews, to kind of uh, get things moving um, on that timeline. So it helps for you um, as the applicant to kind of know where they are at in the process. And that's part of what we'll talk about as well. So it is helpful to start a spreadsheet of the roles that you apply for so you can keep track, in the, keep, tra keep track of them and also keep track of how much communication you've done um, for those positions after you've applied. So you kind of know, hey, okay, I took 
two weeks for them to get back to me about setting up an interview, um, or I haven't heard back from them in a week, maybe it's time to reach out, or, you know, I contacted this organization and I've already set up an informational interview with someone who works there, and you can kind of document these things in a much more structured way if you have a spreadsheet where you're recording that information. So um, highly recommend doing that and saving all the position descriptions as you do so. So when an interview is set up, you can refer to it and that will help you prepare. So um, these are some things that we've noticed um, and uh, in terms of the hiring timelines and the processes that there have been quite a few disruptions um, just because of the nature of COVID and how companies have had to deal with it. So a lot of times, as you all have noticed, the hiring process is drawn out. So maybe it would only take them typically about a month um, to kind of get all this rolling and instead they've reached out and said no um, it's going to take us another two weeks to do this or they may not have told you at all you're just experiencing uh, a length a lengthy amount of time in between all the different steps another thing that might happen is in the process of applying you learn that the employer has to pull the position that they're no longer getting funding for it and they cannot um, they cannot bring you in for an interview any longer Something else might, that might happen is um, you might see positions that are posted and it says, we aren't currently hiring for this role, but we are taking applications for it. And so that's a way for you to um, start kind of working, um, working at connecting with people at that organization. So you're going to submit, you want to submit that application and kind of get to know the organization so that when they do start hiring, you're one of the people that they've already had some connections with and are able to bring in and talk to. Something else that we've heard um, happening um, is an offer uh, gets withdrawn. So made an offer, signed a contract, all of that has happened, but unfortunately they've had to um, do a bunch of layoffs or they're unable to you know, complete that offer and they have to take it back. So um, it's really disappointing when all these things happen um, and it can be really hard to stay positive when uh, things kind of get pulled out from under you after you've put in a lot of work to make this happen. And so um, there are some ways that you can continue moving forward, even if all of this has taken place. So communication is really important here. So staying in touch, even if you've been told, you know, the offer is withdrawn or we're no longer hiring for this position, you've already established a connection with that organization and you've already submitted that application. So that, communi that, um, that communication has started. And so I would recommend continuing with it. So if you're not hearing back from them, make sure that you continue following up. So if there's just kind of a, a lack of communication from the organization um, after you apply, I'd say within seven to days, 10 days of applying, you can call them, you can email them. And it's not about you know, asking, did you get my application, wondering about next steps. It's really a way for you to continue reiterating your interest. So continue to talk about the ways that you you think you'd be a great fit, the ways that you are excited about taking being a part of this organization, and do they have more information about their hiring timeline because you're eager to set up an interview. So um, it's a way to continue having a touch point. Another thing that might happen is your employer of interest is not hiring or they're taking applications but they're not actually going to be interviewing anyone anytime soon, which is disappointing, but this is a good opportunity to start doing those informational interviews with people who work there or with alumni that have had experiences with that organization. And that's where LinkedIn can be a really useful tool. So you can even look up based on um, the organization, even if you go straight to the organization's page, you can look at their, um, everyone who's on LinkedIn who works there and you can filter uh, based on who went to Hamlin. So you can go about it through the Hamlin page or you can go about it through the organization's page as well. Another thing that might happen is maybe you don't get to the next stage of hiring. Maybe they, um, it, it's not an issue of the organization not having enough funding, but maybe you didn't advance in the interview process, which um, can be really disheartening. Um, but it also can be an opportunity to learn more about yourself and the ways that you can be a, um, a stronger candidate next time. And sometimes if you reach out and ask for feedback or ask about other positions within the organization, um, they might respond with some suggestions. Like, 
uh, yeah, it just didn't feel like you were a great fit for this position, but why don't you talk to so-and-so? I think they might be hiring in their department and it might be a good, um, that might be a better fit for you. So it could lead to other connections. So um, I know it can be kind of an intimidating thing to reach out after you've been um, rejected from the next stage of the process, but it can be a way to learn more about how to be an even stronger candidate and find out about something else that might be available. So another search strategy in the context of COVID-19 is it may be the case that positions in your field are uh, minimal. So maybe um, those roles, you're not finding as many of them or the ones that you are finding are so overrun, overrun with applications that you feel like you don't really have a chance right now. Um, I would encourage you to shift gears and find ways to use those, those transferable skills that you have uh, from your previous positions and apply them in a different context. So for example, if you've had a lot of experience in sales and you're not finding roles in the areas that you're most excited about right now, there are ways to use those skills you've developed in sales, like um, excellent time management, re relations with customers, um, managing different accounts and apply them to a different set to a different sector or to a different kind of position. So um, this is kind of the way that you would think about your past roles. What are those things that really stand out and how do you apply them to a different context? Or for example, finance transitioning into marketing. Some people might think, I don't, I don't really see the connections here. But if you look at the need in marketing for interpreting data and looking at the an analytics of who's responding, who's opening um, emails, who's looking at the website. Those technical skills, that ability to interpret data, the, the analytical mindset that comes with working in certain roles in finance can be really useful in a marketing space. And again, it's all about getting creative with those possibilities and being reflective about the ways that your skills are going to be a good fit. So some of this is um, take some work to kind of see yourself in a different light. Um, so it's a mindset shift in some ways, and it's an evaluation of your skills and how they apply in other ways. So I would encourage you to get creative and talking with people in areas of your interest can help you get those juices flowing. I think oftentimes people outside of ourselves can see our abilities and how they might apply in an even stronger way than we can. So I wanna share some career resources that may be useful to you. Um, so LinkedIn is an amazing one, looking at the jobs, using the connections, but I also wanted to point out groups. So one example, um, if you're in the public health field is the Minnesota Public Health Association. And what I would suggest, like depending on your field, just type in Minnesota or Midwest and whatever area you're interested in. And I can almost guarantee there's gonna be um, there's going to be a, a group on LinkedIn that you can join that will often post positions. It's kind of like a, a listserv of opportunities. And then you can see who else is in there and maybe get connected to some people, members of those groups. Handshake is another great one. We also have a career resources um, handout um, that you can access on the alumni website. So those are referrals from our office um, that include um, spaces like um, like the Minnesota Career Development Association, places like that, as well as our career resources during COVID-19 um, handout that has some, some, some advice around how to navigate some of these um, challenging times, even um, accessing unemployment benefits, getting um, support on internet, things like that. And we do have a link on there to our Leo lecture on virtual interviewing. So some job boards that we recommend. Um, so they're, LinkedIn, I think, is a really great overall one. And then these are more specific to particular industries. And I think depending on your area of interest, you will likely find that there is a job board um, that's associated with it, whether it's through a professional association or um, just a website that oversees that. So for nonprofits, the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits Job Board just revamped their website last year, and it's really quite excellent. Paul in Minnesota is another one. Um, and for theater and the arts, Springboard for the Arts is an excellent local 
um, job board. So um, these, uh, some of these are local to Minnesota, others are national. EdPost, for example, for education, for teaching positions, that's um, for Minnesota, and then higher ed jobs for, um, um, for higher ed opportunities uh, is national. And then government jobs is a really great kind of aggregate resource for positions in government agencies, but I would always also encourage you to look specifically at um, city, state, county, and federal sites, uh, because those can give you um, kind of validate um, whether the positions are still being available are still offered and are available to apply to. So I wanted to say before we finish up here, some search tips and tricks. So if you sort by date posted, you're more likely to find more recently posted positions and ones that are definitely accepting applications. Remote is now much more common as a filter. So even if you use, you go to like United Health Group, for example, you'll find that on their career page, remote is one of the, uh, one of the boxes you can check to uh, filter down to those kinds of opportunities. And using the keyword for remote can allow you to look beyond uh, your local area and give you an opportunity to do work for an organization maybe you've always wanted to work for but never wanted to move to California, for example. Um, make sure that you narrow your search. It can be really overwhelming if you're just uh, looking at whatever is available. Um, and especially on LinkedIn, resist the urge for the easy apply. There's an easy apply button that you can click and it just sends them your LinkedIn profile. And sometimes it, the easy apply sends you to a weird third party site. I just always recommend go straight to the source. Don't uh, take the easy way out because it can often um, not allow you to stand out as well as you could um, if you applied directly through the website. Um, you can follow employers. That's a great way to learn, are people hiring? Um, are there layoffs in the works? You can kind of get a sense of what might be happening at those different companies of interest. And a really important thing I want, um, I, I would want to uh, let you all know about is the required versus preferred qualifications. I think oftentimes when we look at position descriptions, the first things we see are all the ways we do not align with the requirements of the role or with the preferred qualifications for the role. Um, required is what they want most people coming into the position to have, and preferred is it would be nice for them to have. So don't take yourself out of the running just because there are a few bullet points that you're unfamiliar with in the job description. Apply anyway, and most of the time, um, they're hoping for not just like the technical stuff, but they want they really want um, someone who would be a good fit for that organization and has the enthusiasm and the work ethic and the willingness to do that work well. So uh, don't take yourself out of the running. Um, they can do that themselves, but at least throw your hat in the ring. So the last things I'll share are, you know, go forth, um, try to stay as positive as you can about yourself and your abilities. That can be hard to do in these difficult times, but don't underestimate the power of your transferable skills of all of how all the things you've done before can relate to things you want to do. Um, and be sure to market yourself effectively. So it's not bragging if it's true. You are stating facts when you talk about your successful moments in your past positions. Um, we can be very humble here at Hamlin. So um, make sure that you are owning your value. Be sure to turn to your network for guidance and keep applying and staying in touch. It is really important to just keep those communication lines flowing. And there have been lots of employers that we've spoken with who are saying, you know, just, just reach out to us. We're happy to stay in touch with you. Um, and there, there is a lot of empathy going around, not, not for everyone, but I think um, the more communication, the better. And so I know we have just a few minutes left, but I wanna make sure that we have some time for questions as well. And there's some more information here about how to get in touch with us if you have specific questions. Thank you, Masha and Mara. Um, before I tee up some questions for you, I just wanna mention if you are watching this um, after the fact, if you find this on our website or the CDC's website or Hamlin's YouTube channel, um, and you are interested in receiving the PowerPoint that Masha and Mara have referenced, email alum at hamlin.edu 
and I can send that out to you. So if you're not watching this live, we won't have your contact information at the ready, but email alum at hamlin.edu and we can be sure and get that to you. So uh, to start, off, start us off, can you say a little bit more about asking about working remotely if it is not expressly called out in a posting? Yeah. Um, so some in, in interviews is usually, I would say, when it would be best to bring that up. Um, so it could be uh, one of the questions that you ask at the very end of the interview is, you know, how have you adjusted your work, the work style um, during COVID-19? What kind of opportunities might there be for remote work? You kind of can get at it that way. Um, if it's a, uh, if it's a, if it's a deal breaker for you, then um, it might be more valuable to kind of understand that on the front end. Um, so I understand that that could be an issue for you. And Mara, if you want to address it as well. Yeah. No, I echo all the same sentiments. Okay. What are you hearing from colleagues in industry about the nature of COVID and in informational interviews? Before these times, informational interviews are very encouraged. And in these times, while they're still encouraged, this person wonders what that means for asks of others' time, especially Black, Indigenous, people of color folks. That's a great question. Yeah. Really great question. Uh, what immediately comes to mind of just the employers I have connected with, and I guess I would caveat by saying most of them are in recruiter roles. They, they really like connecting in person. Um, and so for those of them that are still trying to connect, I think they're still craving that connection. So I think um, be mindful of the position they're in. I would say also as it pertains to kind of just, you know, recognizing all that's kind of happening right now, um, noting that in your email when you reach out and also highlighting that you're flexible. So giving options such as, I know I mentioned like maybe a 20 minute conversation. You could also say, you know, I recognize everything that's going on, kind of share who you are briefly, but then you could even offer, you know, could I ask you some questions via email or chat um, or chat in a video? Um, so that way you can give them options and share understanding like around their capacity um, and then also give them that out too. So I think highlighting those options is going to be really important and sharing that, you know, it doesn't maybe need to happen now, but maybe, you know, in the future and see kind of what they say. And I think most individuals are going to share, like, I have time if you send me some questions via email, which is an ideal, but can still give you really good information. Or I can give you 20 minutes via phone call or video or, you know, maybe not now, it's a little hectic, but I could get to back, maybe, you know, circle back with me in a month or two. Um, I wonder, Masha, if you have additional thoughts. Yeah, I'm just thinking about how um, there is definitely um, a disproportionate burden oftentimes on um, people of color, and Black and Indigenous people of color um, when it comes to um, that outreach and support when, when you are asking a lot of their time and they are probably being asked by a lot of people for information and support, um, especially if they're in positions where they can provide additional context and insight into um, the culture of an organization and whether it is truly as inclusive as it um, purports to be or whether it's a place that would be um, would be welcoming to other people uh, of similar identities. And so I think it's a really um, it's a really great question to ask in terms of kind of balancing that the question of the and the ask for support and advice and also thinking about how you can be potentially supportive of the people that you're also reaching out to so i think oftentimes when we talk about informational interviewing it can sound and feel really one-sided like you are asking so much of this person you're asking them for 30 minutes to go deep and talk about the insights that they have about their companies and the um the advice that they might have to offer you and can they can they suggest any other people for you to talk to it sounds like you're asking a lot of them and i think something to keep in mind is also providing support to them so saying is there anything that i can do here are the 
communities and the organizations and the contacts that I have, would any of these be able to um, help you right now? And so that can feel like a balance of coach. Um, and I think that's that's true in any context, but I think it's especially true of the the people who hold identities who are disproportionately asked at higher rates to be to to be those contacts for people. So just know that it's mutual. And if it's not, if you don't feel like you're being explicit about how mutual it could be, offering it up. What can I do for you? You've done so much for me. What can I do to support you? I'm going to ask one last question. And this is uh, perhaps more geared towards folks who are really recently out of school. In COVID, have you seen any industries who you think um, will be hiring more as a result? Or are there any, you know, for somebody who might be sort of wide open in terms of the fields they're looking at, uh, are there places where you're saying, you know, in the last six months, here are some industries, industries who are actually still really hiring or perhaps even hiring more? Uh, the two that come to mind, and I'm sure Marsha will have additional, but I think Health and Human Services is one that is continuing to hire. There's a lot of care, caretaking roles that are still need to be filled, and um, I know that that's been a hard, um, if you're able to do that, and you have the capacity to do that, I think that that's been, um, and you kind of are hoping to get more kind of um, of that helping role background and experience. I think that's an area that's still really in high need and they're having a hard time filling those roles. I would say another area is any digital platforms that exist for online learning, supporting, you know, institutions and data. Um, I'm thinking of just some of the platforms like Hamlin uses. So any, um, and I can't quite figure out the words, like it's more of like the digital, digital support and um, digital platforms that people are engaging at in a much higher rate than they have been before. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna mention digital platforms, tech support, IT is huge. Um, right now there's a, there's a high need and some of those areas are definitely growing and adding new positions. Um, and, um, yeah, th that's what I would, that's what I was going to say, but it's kind of hard to tell. It depends on some of the organizations, like we're seeing ebbs and flows in so many different spaces that are hiring and then shutting it down and then hiring again and then shutting it down. So there's a really helpful dashboard that is included in our COVID career resource page where you can actually see who's hiring, who's on hold, um, who, uh, which organizations um, are you here, like have people been reporting uh, layoffs and things like that. So you can track it pretty effectively that way. Thank you so much. Thank you both. Um, we really appreciate your time and your expertise per usual. Uh, and I'm just gonna say one more time, if you're watching this after, uh, what is today, September 30th? If you're watching this later on um, and you want to get your hands on the PowerPoint and all the, with the resources that has been mentioned, please just email alum at hanlon.edu and we will get it to you. And those of you who are here uh, live with us, uh, we will send that out to you as well. Um, and thank you again, uh, all, all of our best to everybody who is looking for a job and looking to make a change in the next year during these very unprecedented times. Um, we hope that uh, we can continue to offer you some encouragement and support. All right, thanks everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.